also use a chat feature. Uh, the only uh, disadvantage with the chat feature is that if we get really engaged in a lot of uh, comments and conversations, it's hard to track them. So we would prefer you use the, the Q&A so that we can monitor it um, effectively. Uh, just a reminder as well that we're going to mute um, all the, um, the audience members as well and your videos are going to be turned off really so that we can focus in on the main discuss well on the panelists. Um, and uh, let me spend some time just presenting uh, the, the panelists. So what we're going to be doing as uh, per usual is we're going to be going based on the um, the order uh, in the schedule for today. So as I said before, uh, today's panel is um, on ballot design and we're gonna start off with um, Ezra, right? Um, uh, Iseva Ikinchi. And interestingly, Ezra pointed out, right, that her name is actually the acronym for a conference. So that's quite fitting, right? And what she's going to be doing is uh, looking at electoral reforms in parliamentary democracies and talking a little bit about the strategic decisions that are taken by ruling parties and how that might affect vote share of, um, of, of smaller parties. Uh, and then after her presentation, we'll, I'll present the the other two two papers. So off to you, uh, Ezra, and thanks so much for your participation. Thank you. Uh, let me share the uh, yeah uh, presentation. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to present here, and thank you the organizers for the uh, for organizing this conference during this. Uh, difficult times. Um, the paper that I'm going to be presenting today is about the electoral reforms in parliamentary democracies. And the research question I'm tackling in this paper is uh, why and when and democracies change their uh, electoral rules? And this, has, this question has been addressed in mostly case studies and to some extent uh, in cross-country uh, comparisons. But one common point in all these uh, existing studies is that they predominantly focus on the successfully implemented uh, electoral system changes. And uh, less attention has been devoted to the attempted but uh, failed reforms. In this paper, I've incorporated both failed and successful electoral reforms together to uh, analyze when and how governments uh, form a pro-reform preferences and pro to propose an electoral system change. And um, I believe the, the incorporation of failed attempts are really important because uh, these attempts show that governing parties have an interest in changing the electoral system and they are motiva motivated enough uh, to, uh, to come up with the different proposals for, uh, uh, for electoral systems. And uh, in this paper, I analyze the conditions under which uh, governments initiate an electoral reform. Uh, and I build on the uh, explanations that are uh, based on party system variables. And so uh, there is this trend of uh, literature uh, that aims to identify when, uh, uh, when electoral reforms become more likely in a given uh, given political system, and there are different uh, explanations, and these explanations partly um, uses, uh, in general, uses two different variables of uh, party system, uh, two different party system variables. One of the variables they, that has been used is the party system fragmentation, and the, the, uh, the explanations uh, uh, either see the party system fragmentation as a source of uncertainty, uh, to which uh, uh, existing parties respond with, an, with implementing uh, a less risky uh, electoral rule, meaning that more proportional electoral systems have been implemented. Uh, implemented. And, in, uh, and there is another uh, explanation which focuses on the governability uh, problem that the high frag highly fragmented party system poses and that's in that kind of uh, situations they argue this explanation uh, argues that the um the electoral uh, uh, the the existing political parties will adopt a, a restrictive reform to 
to uh, restrict the number of uh, small parties in the in the parliament. And all these explanations kind of treat the party system uh, very well as having a symmetrical effect on the existing parties. And I argue that uh, this is not necessarily true. And I think new and small parties can draw votes from either one of the existing party uh, rather than the other one. And it can uh, affect the, uh, the existing uh, parties asymmetrically. And this, especially the, uh, it can uh, affect the uh, electoral competition between the largest uh, political parties. And from this intuition, I uh, developed my uh, hypothesis about electoral reform initiation behavior. And I think uh, if small parties gain votes for at the expense of the of the uh, one of the leading parties, it's kind of uh, it affects the uh, competition between leading parties, and this differential uh, impact of the fragmentation shapes the preferences of the governing party with respect to the status quo. And in, uh, if, for instance, there are high number of uh, uh, small parties which are closer to the governing party, then the governing party has a problem uh, in terms of gain uh, in for future elections because though, uh, there could be a vote shifts from the governing party which uh, to the small parties that are close to uh, the, the ideologically closer to the government party. However, uh, in, uh, and I think in these kind of situations, it's best uh, uh, in these kind of situations, uh, government, uh, governing party might have an incentive to implement a restrictive reform to decrease the number of the po uh, political parties that are close to its uh, ideological platform. And in this way, uh, it can uh, try to sustain its, uh, its leading position in the party competi competition. And, uh, and this uh, definitely will, the high degree of competition then will have a reverse effect on the permissive rules because permissive uh, reforms uh, would uh, enable more competition in the government uh, governing parties uh, uh, ideological uh, cluster and this would affect the uh, inc uh, this would in, in the end would uh, uh, decrease the uh, uh, the incentives for the political party to adopt a permissive reform for this purposes. And, um, and I think permissive reforms then uh, are a tool to kind of, uh, can be used as a tool to weaken the, the competi competing opposition party for this reason, because it would open up the competition and the, the governing party would have an uh, incentive uh, to do that if, uh, if, uh, if the, the, if, if the governing party itself faces much less competition than the uh, than the uh, oppo uh, leading opposition party, and this is the uh, this differential uh, and uh, relative uh, impact that I'm talking about is the basis of my hypothesis, my second hypothesis. The higher the number of competitors uh, the main opposition party clusters have. Uh, than that of the government, the more like it's more likely to see uh, permissive reforms. So, so to test these hypotheses, uh, I use a novel uh, data set of electoral reform attempts since uh, during the post-war era until 2015 in two, 32 parliamentary democracies. And I define electoral reform as a change in the four main components of the electoral system, which is district magnitude, uh, tier structure, whether there is an upper uh, tier in the electoral uh, uh, formula and the seat allocation formula. And lastly, the electoral threshold, uh, uh, this is, which is a legal threshold that the parties have to pass in order to gain access uh, to, um, to the parliament. And uh, the attempts, when I try to, uh, when I uh, identify the attempts, I, uh, I define electoral attempt as it in two, uh, in two different uh, aspects. First, the, the proposal has to come from the, um, from the uh, governing party and either it has to be either uh, submitted to the parliament or referendum vote, uh, or uh, there should be a committee in the parliament that, uh, that uh, deals with this, um, this uh, proposal. And the opposition for party proposals or civil society organizations' demands are not included as an attempt in this study. 
and it uh, for um, it, the electoral reform uh, reforms are as I discussed there are the two different types and uh, the 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 changes in these four uh, components if they increase the proportionality of the system they are uh, coded as permissive electoral reform attempts and if they, de they decrease the proportionality of the system then they are coded as a restrictive reform attempts. Uh, overall, I have identified 124 electoral reform attempts in the uh, sample of countries that I have. But um, however, some countries, for instance, had two or three uh, electoral reform attempts, usually uh, two, just one example of three. Uh, but um, this kind of posed a problem because the unit of analysis is the um, is the legislative term and the election cycle. Uh, so uh, what I did for this is that um, I, um, I uh, only take one of the electoral re uh, reform attempts and this didn't cause a problem for, per uh, uh, legislative cycle. And this didn't pose a problem because all of the electoral reforms that are initiated in the same uh, legislative term were in the same direction. And all in all, it uh, gave me a total of 109 electoral reform attempts per, uh, when, when I counted them as such. And uh, 68 of them are uh, restrictive uh, reform attempts and 41 are uh, permissive ones. So the, the main variable uh, the, of interest that, uh, uh, to test my hypothesis is the number, effective number of parties in the ideological bloc which is closer to government. And there's also uh, a, a different, uh, the same uh, formula is being used to, um, to calculate it for the opposition party as well. And what I did was to, uh, when I, um, when I uh, construct this variable is that I had identified the main uh, government party and the main opposition party in each uh, election. And then I categorized the political parties according to their ideological distance from the main governing party and from the opposition party into different clusters. And I then, uh, <clears throat> I then uh, uh, as, uh, uh, after assigning these parties to ideological blocks, I uh, weighted the vote share of each party by the total shares of the parties in a given block uh, by excluding the uh, the governing and the main opposition party, and I calculated the effective number of the parties in uh, in the ideological blocks. And here are the results from the uh, multinomial regression uh, analysis that I uh, conducted. And in all uh, the uh, models that I have, which have different uh, uh, different um, <clears throat> control variables. Uh, I find that the number of uh, parties in the ideological cluster of the government has a negative effect for the permissive reform as expected by in the hypothesis, first hypothesis and a positive effect on the likelihood of the uh, restrictive reforms. And this, uh, this, can be, um, this can be also shown as this, uh, this in this figure uh, as the um, governing parties are more likely to respond to high number of competitors in their ideological cluster by initiating a, a restrictive reform. And when the cluster is not pro, uh, fragmented, the probability of the um, permissive reform, for instance, is around 15 and it, uh, uh, and it decreases uh, uh, the permissive reform attempts uh, uh, probability of a permissive reform attempt decreases uh, when the uh, number uh, <clears throat> number increases, the, the uh, fragmentation number increases. And uh, the hypothesis, second hypothesis postulates the, the, the differential effect. Um, okay, this is the uh, addition, uh, I included the additional control and it, the, the main uh, the main finding here is that the, even I control for the electoral volatility, the main effect is the same. And uh, here we see the, uh, the, um, the figure as well, uh, which shows the uh, confidence interval for this effect. And finally, I test the uh, second hypothesis uh, about the relative, 
uh, relative uh, number of uh, parties in each ideological clusters. And I find that uh, uh, when the opposition parties cluster is more, um, more fragmented uh, than the government parties, uh, permissive reforms become more uh, likely, but the, the reverse effect is not observed for rest uh, restrictive reforms. Uh, I don't find any really significant relationship. But uh, different to the, um, to the first hypothesis, when I control for the electoral vol volatility, this uh, difference in fragmentation variable becomes insignificant statistically insignificant, so it's not very robust to the inclusion of different uh, control variables. And I think I have just one minute to sum it up. Uh, in, in all, all in all, uh, this uh, paper kind of include, uh, included uh, uh, the um, failed reform attempts, which are also a part of the electoral reform process. Uh, and the developed a different uh, different idea uh, explanation about how a uh, party system competition can affect the electoral reform decision of the government and here i use the ideological proximity of small parties to the main party uh, in government and also opposition to create a new variable uh, that can uh, that can measure the asymmetrical effect that the party system fragmentation can have and on the competition between the, the main parties. And, um, and this, this is how I want to end uh, my uh, discussion. And I'm open to any questions uh, from the floor. Thank you. So thanks so much, uh, Ezra, and, and, and thanks so much for also being so cognizant uh, of the time. You actually came in one minute under um, the expected time. So kudos to you, right? Um, great job. Um, our, our, our next panelist uh, is uh, Shiro uh, Kuriwaki. Uh, and uh, Shiro is doing some fantastic work uh, looking at ways in which uh, you can leverage uh, data from um, voting records and also survey data to get a better understanding of swing voters, right? The title of the uh, presentation is uh, Swing Straight Ticket, Split Ticket, and Ballot Roll-Off. And I'll hand it over to Shiro uh, to uh, start uh, his presentation. Thank you so much, Shiro. Thank you, Nicholas, and thanks for having me. Um, please let me know if I, the screen, the slides are not working. Um, so, yes, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Shiro. I'm a um, political science grad student at Harvard. Uh, this is my second time presenting at ESRA, so I'm really um, excited to get all your feedback and see all the interesting presentations. Uh, so as Nicholas said, this is about a clustering approach. This is more of a methods paper uh, for characterizing voter types with an application to uh, ballot data like cast vote records and also survey data. And it arises from what I think is a very common uh, task for many observers, people who use election data, which is that we want to uh, take uh, the electorate and group them into understandable uh, prototypes or bins. So we might group these groups in by demographics, like the soccer mom, for example, or we might be interested in grouping blocks of voters by their vote choice. So for example, this paper that I'm going to return to in this presentation looked at uh, whether uh, the ideological composition of voters who vote for Ralph Nader and whether in the apps, if Nader had not run, if um, had those votes had gone to Al Gore. Um, and recently, I think uh, a lot of us are interested in this particular block of swing uh, voter block, which we tend to kind of loosely refer to as swing voters. These are voters who might be indifferent to either party in rough terms and so might be persuadable uh, for the general election. Well, this is just one uh, the example I'm going to focus on, but generally uh, kind of summarizing complex data into blocks is a common exercise uh, for a lot of us. So we, in order to do this, we have increasingly, we have lots of rich data about people's vote choice. So in, uh, so in for uh, one example I'm going to use are cast vote records. These are, as many of you know, are actual readouts of ballots that people have cast. Uh, and you can, uh, these are anonymous ballots, but they often record 
the full range, full vector of offices that a person voted for. And so it makes it easy to uh, compare uh, the types of voting patterns for each office. This is a ballot record from South Carolina that I use in other papers. Um, and also in increasingly in survey data as well, although these are samples and these are self-report, people have, diff uh, people we ask uh, respondents how they voted for a range of offices. Uh, and this is also kind of rich data, especially if you want to know who are the voters who are swing and are persuadable uh, and might split their ticket. But the main problem uh, with this data is that once we get to actual ballots and large surveys, there's hundreds of possible patterns of uh, combinatorical patterns of how people vote, uh, even for simple cases like vote Democrat, Republican, or abstain. And so simple descriptive statistics about how prevalent each pattern is gets pretty intractable uh, somewhat quickly. So existing studies, especially and kind of working off the studies of ticket splitting here is mostly, for the most part, start with pairwise comparisons like the president and the U.S. House and then study that. Study that. Or they might have multiple offices and they uh, take uh, kind of um, they, they, they show all the pairwise comparisons possible in like a correlation plot and analyze that. Um, this can get, this either uh, discards the valuable information that we have for each person or it gets hard to uh, get the big picture. There's also another strand of methods that uh, computes ideal points from voting data like this. And this is a good way to summarize data as well, but it's, it imposes a single dimensional and often and a bell-shaped uh, distributional assumption about how these voters' preferences are allocated. So this, um, the approach here is an alter alternative approach that I want to explain. And this basically takes the uh, multidimensional nature of the ballot data and, summer and figures out what's the, uh, what's, what's the best kind of, pat what's the best prototypes that explain this complex set of voters, uh, voter pro patterns well. And I'm going to uh, apply this, I'm, I'll go through the model and I'll apply this to, uh, just as illustration purposes, uh, ballots in Florida and the CCS, which is a large political survey. Okay, so the model. I, had, I have one slide for the, how the, what the assumptions are of the model and how it works. So the uh, starting assumption is that uh, we, um, we often consistent with what we often imagine the electorate to be, we often think that a voter belongs to a, a cluster, one of K clusters, which I'll call Z. Um, however, we don't know, we don't observe that voter's cluster. The only thing that we know from data is how they voted. For example, in this application, I'm interested in how they voted, um, uh, whether they split their ticket, whether they voted straight ticket uh, relative to some reference category where they undervoted or something else in a particular office. From this data, we have a couple of quantities of interest. Uh, so first, uh, one thing we want to know is whether given their vo voting pattern, what's the probability that this voter is in this particular cluster? Uh, second, we want to know in general, how large is each uh, of the clusters that uh, I want to infer? And third, and probably most importantly, we want to know in each uh, cluster, um, how likely is the voters of that cluster to vote a certain way, for example, split their ticket in a particular office. So for example, if you were a um, you know, campaign manager for a US House election, you might be interested in how many, what's the kind of swing vote block in your district? How large is it? Is it big enough to be pivotal? Uh, and among that block, uh, are do voters split their ticket differentially depending on the office, like governor or US Senate? Um, so these are some of the quantities of interest that we want to estimate from the data. Uh, we, I'm going to try to keep it simple and pose just a, one additional model. So the model of vote, vote, voting is basically this uh, third quantity of interest, mu, uh, is the probability that you vote a certain way for a given cluster. And then for tractability, like almost all clustering algorithms do, uh, we assume that conditional on the cluster, the offices are independent from each other. And the, um, um, the upshot is that we basically impose a simple model and we want to find the values of these quantities of interest that are most likely given the model and the data. Uh, this is, um, falls pretty closely to 
the existing work on categorical outcomes and clustering. Um, in addition, one of the things I add is a um, ass assumption that allows us to model uncontested races where the choice set uh, is limited in some districts and not others. And basically, this is a kind of multidimensional problem with a missing variable, so we cannot just do regression. The EM algorithm is just a way to uh, iteratively figure out what's the values of the parameters that match this data. So from the, from in the simplest case, from a vote matrix, we want to know uh, for the user picks a number of clusters he or she wants to analyze, and we want to know how big is that cluster and what are the characteristics of that cluster. So I've applied this to two examples. Uh, first is uh, about cars in Palm Beach County in Florida. This is taken from data that uh, Michael Heron and Jeff Lewis have uh, kind of cleaned. And um, I focused on Palm Beach in their article about Ralph Nader. And I focused on Palm Beach County mainly because there's lots of county level offices that voters in Palm Beach County voted on in the 2000 presidential election. So apply this, I, I take, um, I model four clusters and each, uh, this top panel uh, shows a clustering algorithm when I do it on people, voters who voted for Al Gore. And then the bottom panel uh, shows the same result when I do it for, uh, apply the clustering algorithm to voters who voted for uh, George Bush. So um, just to walk through this figure, uh, so the offices are in columns. So I've aligned from the top of the ballot to the bottom, from U.S. Senator to County Tax Collector, the offices that were on the ballot. Um, I have facets for each cluster that I estimate, and the size of each cluster is denoted, the, which is the pi variable, is denoted uh, in the facet. Um, and the colored bars are basically the uh, is the mu variable. It's the how likely is it for a, per, a person in a given cluster to vote a certain way for a given office. Uh, and this is uh, recoded everything so that the uh, values are relative to the party choice in the presidential election. Okay, so there's a couple of interesting patterns here that I want to highlight uh, here. So first, if you, I've ordered the clusters by size, and first, the first thing we see is that this, uh, let's see, this uh, first cluster here comprises the majority of the Gore and Bush voters. And if you, these are all dark blue or dark red, which means that these voters are solid partisan voters. So about 55% of the electorate uh, vote for Gore and then vote Democrat uh, down to county tax collector and same for Bush. Okay. Um, so we might think these are not very persuadable voters. Secondly, there's cluster two, uh, it's about 25 to 30%, uh, has, um, is more likely to vote straight than not, but there's a decent probability that they vote for, that they split their ticket relative to president. And an uh, interesting pattern here is that the rate, the propensity to split people's their ticket increases as you go down the ballot, that is for state and local elections as opposed to congressional elections. Uh, this is uh, consistent with things that I found in South Carolina cast vote records. Uh, and I argue that this is probably because in state and local elections, even though these might be low salient elections where party cues might be prevalent, there's a large incumbency advantage still and candidate differentials uh, are more stark in local elections. So this cluster two is kind of an interesting group of swing voters. Uh, cluster three uh, is 8% in both Gore and Bush voters, uh, and these voters seem to uh, are more most likely to roll off uh, on the ballot. But interestingly, so these prototypical voters tend to vote uh, straight party in U.S. House and U.S. Senate, but then once you go down to state level offices, they uh, uh, start to abstain. And then cluster four, just five to ten percent of the uh, population is more likely to split their ticket than swing. So the so again the clustering algorithm is basically a simple summary of the uh, multitude of complex patterns there are in the data. And when if you kind of try to summarize the data into four clusters, this is what you get. And I think it reveals something uh, um, clearly about uh, voting box. So this is also Palm Beach County. So I also looked at this is this did not make it into the paper, but I also looked at uh, the voting patterns of. Uh, voters who voted for Pat Buchanan on the presidential 
uh, presidential office. And so I looked at their parties now. So all of this is now recoded with, re with respect to the US Senate race. Um, so this is a panel about ballot design. Um, so uh, voters who voted for Pat Buchanan in Palm Beach County and then went on to vote for a partisan candidate in the US Senate race look awfully lot, a lot like Al Gore voters, um, confirming the uh, uh, kind of the um, implications of the butterfly ballot that have been documented extensively elsewhere. So for all these kind of uh, propensities and cluster sizes look pretty similar to what we see for Al Gore voters. Um, uh, go boys. Uh, of course, so if you, these, um, let's see. So, and moreover, Pat Buchanan voters were more likely to vote for Bill Nelson, the Democrat, than for the Republican 80-20. And this is what the famous butterfly ballot uh, paper also shows. But with the clustering algorithm, we can simplify the down ballot races and show that not only for US Senate, but also for these down ballot offices, uh, people who, uh, cast her ballot for Pat Buchanan, also uh, behaved, qu voted quite similarly to Al Gore voters. Okay, um, so the second application I want to go through uh, relatively quickly is survey data. So just like ballot data, survey data, uh, if you have vote choice for multiple offices, uh, you, can add, you can apply the cluster argument pretty, pretty similar to survey data as well. And this might be a more common application uh, for uh, election analysts. So CCS is a multi-state uh, large online survey. Uh, so this allows us to compare different states and compare different years. Okay, I look at 2018 and um, in the paper I've analyzed a bunch of states, 10 states that have these four offices on the ballot, uh, but I'll highlight just four of them here. So in similar to what I found in Florida, I see that the largest cluster in all of these states are uh, kind of straight party voters. So they're a big, there's a, there's, they're a homogeneous flock that votes for a single party. And here, uh, this is reference to, the reference category here is their partis partisan self-identification, not their uh, particular vote. So even when you use that variable, uh, the majority of voters are kind of straight ticket voters. But there's very interesting variation across states and across offices as well. So if you, um, um, I just picked two interesting examples. So in Massachusetts and Maryland, cluster two, which is uh, 20 to 30 percent of the electorate, uh, is basically the governor vote for Charlie Baker and Larry Hogan, who are the two most popular governors in the country at the time of the election. And these, um, if you look at the covariates that predict cluster membership, these are Democratic people who identify as Democrats who vote for the Republican governor incumbent. Um, but interestingly, they don't vote for the, they don't split their ticket in the U.S. Senate or U.S. House race, only for the governor. Um, similarly, for uh, in Ohio and Minnesota, uh, we see uh, in a smaller cluster, it's 5% or 3% of the vote, uh, similar uh, patterns splitting for U.S. Senate only. So in Ohio, that's Sherrod Brown, and in Minnesota, that's Amy Klobuchar. Um, and again, these are, uh, first of all, these are pretty, especially for the senator vote, these can be pretty small uh, sizes, and it's interesting to know how small they are. Uh, but it's also interesting to know that um, across different states, uh, people seem to vote selectively for different offices, not just go top of the, uh, top of the ballot to down. Um, this also, I've looked at, I've looked at 10 states, this does not happen, for example, uh, for Scott Walker in Wisconsin, same year, uh, it's kind of the opposite for Greg Abbott in Texas, where Republicans uh, selectively split their ticket against Abbott. Um, but uh, this is um, the findings from the survey. So just to wrap up, uh, so this is a illustration of a clustering algorithm. It's useful for high dimensional and categorical data and finding blocks, measuring latent quant quantities instead of just relying on the sample. Um, there's also, there, I do think there is a concern about whether clustering is too black box when we try to apply this to survey data. Um, the most popular clustering algorithm is designed by political scientists, Linzer and Lewis, but it's, as far as I know, it's rarely, it's rarely used in political science research. And um, 
what I would say is that this uh, algorithm is fairly is simple, but it's model based. So it's not just a black box putting similar uh, uh, voters together. And the interpretation uh, still depends on substantive prior knowledge. So it's not a claim about you know, whether one or two dimensions is enough to explain the public, uh, but it's given if you want to divide the electorate up into a couple of clusters, what's the most likely pattern. Um, and finally, uh, this is the first time I'm presenting this paper. So I'm uh, in this and other work, I'm collecting uh, cast vote records from other states. Uh, for this paper, I'll try to uh, compare it with ideal point methods and what the characteristics are, um, and also update the algorithm so that it can pool candidate level characteristics. Uh, and generally, uh, in the dissertation, I'm trying to look value who are swing voters, what they respond to, and how, uh, how prevalent are they in the nationalized era. So thanks again, and I look forward to any comments. All right, Chiro, thank you so much for a, a great presentation. And uh, the next um, paper on the panel uh, is titled Using Straight Part, the, Using the Straight Party Option to Understand Satisficing While Voting. It continues this discussion about um, uh, straight ticket voting and ballot design. And we have um, presenting Matthew Thornburg, as well as uh, his two co-authors, uh, Garrison Davis, as well as uh, Duncan Bell. So I just want to hand it over to, Math, uh, to Matthew and, and thank uh, him and his co-authors for uh, their presentation. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nic Nicholas. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity to present our research here at Ezra. Um, this is my first time at the conference, and uh, we're just really thrilled to share our findings here. Um, all right. Our paper is part of a line of research that examines the effect of ballot design features on voter behavior. Uh, specifically, this paper. Uh, we examine the effect of the straight party or straight ticket option on nonpartisan roll off. Um, straight party option is a ballot feature. It's available in about nine states, give or take a few. Um, and it's, it allows individuals to go into a ballot box, uh, select a political party, and populate their ballot with votes for um, all, all candidates of that party. And then the voter can review the ballot and then finally submit it. Uh, one of the notable features of the straight party option, though, is that it, of course, does not mark votes for nonpartisan races or referenda. The voter is expected to make those choices while they're reviewing the ballot after they've selected the straight party option. So we might expect, therefore, that um, to find nonpartisan roll-off and voter error is higher among straight ticket voters. Um, and that's just at least initially what we see. Um, this is some data that I, I um, use or I found using cast vote records in 2018. This just happens to be the school board district that I live in in Aiken County, South Carolina. Uh, for a nonpartisan, intensely contested school board race in South Carolina, cast vote records show that of individuals who use the straight ticket option, about 40% rolled off of this question. They did not cast a vote for nonpartisan school board. On, on contrast, among voters who went through the ballot manually and did not vote straight ticket, only about 12% of voters rolled off of this question. Now, this is a uh, ground that's been tread before. Um, there, have been pro there have been studies that have looked at the relationship between the straight ticket option and nonpartisan roll off. But there's a little bit of disagreement in the literature on whether this is due to voter error, whether individuals just select the straight ticket option, they fail to understand that they need to vote in these nonpartisan contests and roll off unintentionally, or whether this is an intentional choice on the part of straight ticket voters. Um, and this study that we're presenting today brings two new innovations to the table. Um, first, we are the, uh, we're the first study looking exclusively at nonpartisan roll off to use individual level data. Uh, we use cast vote records um, uh, from South Carolina's 2018 general election. Uh, these 
data are very useful. They allow us to forgo ecological inference and look at these relationships directly at the level of the voter. We also add to a growing body of literature that ties the process of completing a ballot to the same psychological mechanisms as completing a survey. In particular, we theorize that what's going on here is voter error is part of it, but there's also intentional satisficing on the part of straight ticket voters. So to begin with, um, our initial first pass through this was to look at uh, patterns of roll off among straight ticket and non straight ticket voters. Um, specifically, we looked at Charleston County, South Carolina's 2018 general election. There were between five and eight nonpartisan elected offices on every ballot in Charleston County, depending on the district that the voters resided in. There was also a, uh, a constitutional amendment put on the ballot. And um, we examined, we looked at, um, at individuals who used the straight ticket and did not use the straight ticket and their patterns of roll off. Now, the decision to use the straight ticket option is not random. Um, it's a conscious choice on the part of voters. And so we, we, we matched individuals on their vote for governor, Democrat or Republican. We matched them on their precinct and we matched them on the type of ballot that they, uh, that they used to vote. Um, and the, the, the graph on your screen kind of shows the results from a number of different metrics. Uh, the four clusters in each graph on the right hand side are four at large nonpartisan elections that occurred in Charleston County. What you see is that the green bar representing straight ticket voters among Democrats and Republicans is larger. More people, more straight ticket voters rolled off these questions than non straight ticket voters. But with the cast vote records, we can dig a little bit deeper into the data and and go a little bit further in our, into our analysis. And so if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the, the two smaller bars, these are individuals who left all nonpartisan uh, races and ballot questions blank. Um, and you see that very few voters did this, but the, among those who did, straight ticket voters were significantly more likely to do so. In addition, the second to the left, um, uh, cluster of bars are people who just left all um, nonpartisan elected offices blank. So they might have voted in the constitutional amendment question, but they left all the nonpartisan offices on the ballot blank. And once again, we see that straight ticket voters much more likely to engage in this behavior. Um, what we did to kind of uh, dig into the data even further is we coded uh, the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of uh, their cast vote records. We categorized each cast vote record into one of four um, qualitative groups. Uh, people who voted for all nonpartisan elected offices, people who voted for none of the nonpartisan elected offices, left all of them blank, uh, people who began to vote for nonpartisan elected offices, but midway through kind of broke off and discontinued voting, um, and then individuals who voted for nonpartisan elected offices, but might have abstained from one or two here and there. And what we see among both Democrats and Republicans is that um, indivi individuals who use the straight ticket option were significantly less likely to vote for all nonpartisan elected offices. Uh, they were more likely to leave all of those offices blank, and they were more likely to go through and just kind of selectively abstain. Um, just another example here. Uh, this graph shows the four countywide nonpartisan offices in Charleston County. This is just voters who voted for at least one nonpartisan elected office. So we can think of these as voters who are aware of the need to vote in these races, but they abstain from these contests anyway. And we see once again, that straight ticket voters are more likely to engage in this behavior. And that indicates to us that at least partially, this is an intentional behavior. The set abstention on the part of straight ticket voters is intentional. So why? Um, in understanding why individuals who use this option are more likely to roll off, uh, we turn to the literature on survey satisficing. Um, satisficing is the psychological process of foregoing the necessary cognitive effort 
of completing a task at, at the best level, and just kind of doing a good enough job. Um, and in essence, yeah, it's, it's just doing it, doing just enough to get by. And satisficing can take a lot of forms and survey methodology. It can include, you know, selecting the first choice, selecting the status quo, um, or item non-response, which we equate here with, with roll off. Um, Krosnick theorizes in the initial paper on survey satisficing that it's a combination, it's an interactive combination of three different factors. It's the difficulty of the task that the respondent faces, it's the respondent's motivation to complete the task, and their ability to do so. And we theorize here that individuals who use the straight party option have a lower inherent motivation to complete nonpartisan questions. Now, because of the interact, the multiplicative interaction here, um, we theorize that questions that are already prone to induce roll off among voters, individuals using the straight ticket option should be especially affected. Um, on the other hand, uh, questions that are particularly salient or easy to answer on the ballot, uh, individuals using the straight ticket voter voting uh, voting option should be. Uh, less likely to roll, uh, the gap between uh, those individuals and non-straight ticket voters in roll off should be lower. So there, there, there's a statistical interaction here between the, the likelihood of rolling off of a task or rolling off of a question and the usage of the straight ticket option. And we test this two different ways. Um, first, we return to cast vote records in Charleston, South Carolina. And we're looking here at ballot length. Um, the research shows that, that satisficing in surveys increases with fatigue. We also know that roll off in voting increases with fatigue as well. And uh, ballots in Charleston County in the 2018 election um, contained between five and eight nonpartisan questions, but they all ended with this constitutional amendment referendum um, to change the superintendent of education to an appointed position. And so there's a bit of a quasi experiment we can, we can use here um, where different, different districts and different areas of the county um, had different numbers of nonpartisan questions on the ballot before getting to that constitutional amendment question. And so um, basically what we do is we, we look at Democrats and Republicans in Charleston County, we record the number of nonpartisan questions on the ballot for each cast vote record, and, um, and we examine how that affects both the, how that interacts with the straight ticket option, but also, um, also um, the, the length of the ballot. We hypothesize that roll off on the constitutional amendment is higher among straight ticket voters compared to non-straight ticket voters, um, but also that roll off on the amendment is higher on longer ballots. And then finally, um, that if, if satisficing is actually the explanation we see here, we should see an interaction between these variables. The longer the ballot, the greater the effect of voting straight ticket option on roll off for the amendment. And this, the, the model, we used a, we used a logit model, um, that's, that's in the paper. Um, this is just the predicted probabilities that we see. Um, and um, what we see is that, yes, as, as the length of the, the number of nonpartisan questions on the ballot increases, um, roll off on that final constitutional amendment increases as well. But we see as well that um, the effect is particularly pronounced among straight ticket voters. And this is both Democrats and Republicans. There is a, there's a significant difference um, between straight ticket and non-straight ticket voters. And so this, this seems to confirm that difficult questions or areas where respondents are fatigued, the effect of the straight ticket vote, the straight ticket option on roll off increases. Um, and then, um, we, we conduct one last test of this question. Um, this, is, this follows a paper by Bonu and Lepp. Um, they find that the effect of the straight ticket option on nonpartisan judicial roll off um, increases um, or, or not, is, is greater in straight, straight ticket states, uh, but that, that effect is offset by campaign spending. Um, 
while nonpartisan judicial elections taking place in straight ticket states experience higher levels of roll off than nonpartisan judicial elections in non straight ticket states, um, campaign spending serves to offset this effect. So in other words, the, the effect of the straight ticket option in leading to roll off diminishes as spending in the election increases. And this is in keeping once again with the theory of satisficing, which suggests that higher levels of roll off among voters who lack the, uh, the, the information uh, to, to make an informed choice on who to vote for. And this proclivity of rolling off once again interacts with the lower motivation of straight ticket voters. And so to test this theory, um, we examine roll off in nonpartisan school board elections throughout South Carolina. In 2018, we use the cast vote records again. In particular, we look at races occurring in single member districts that had three candidates. And there were 17 such races across South Carolina. And this gives us, using the, the Democrats and the Republicans based on their vote for governor, using the cast vote records in these 17 races, um, we have a data set with which to examine roll off in these school board elections. Um, and we predict following Bono and Lepp's theory or, or their analysis that increased campaign spending lowers roll off in these nonpartisan school board races and that straight ticket voters are more likely to roll off. But once again, that we expect to see an interaction here that, um, that straight ticket voters are more likely to roll off, but higher levels of campaign spending will offset that effect. And that's, that's just what we see here, looking once again at Democrats and Republicans. Um, the uh, spending decreases roll off, but especially so among straight ticket voters. Um, all right, so for those who've been following the elimination of straight ticket voting in, uh, in Texas and the litigation that's been going on there, um, the Texas Democratic Party sued the state of Texas or was part of that lawsuit uh, to challenge the elimination of the straight ticket option. And they contended uh, in, the, in the lawsuit that uh, use of the, eliminating the straight ticket option, getting rid of it would lead to increased roll off. It would lead, especially on longer ballots, and it would lead to voter, con voter confusion. And so when we look just at nonpartisan races, the evidence that we bring to bear here casts some doubt on that. Um, we show nonpartisan contests, roll off is higher among straight ticket voters, and it's at least partially intentional. Um, the tests we perform show that individuals using the straight ticket option, um, they roll off in ways that are consistent with satisficing and where questions are difficult to answer or respondents are fatigued, straight ticket voters are especially likely to engage in this nonpartisan roll off. Um, there are of course areas that remain to be covered here. Um, importantly, we, we need to know why or how straight ticket voting affects um, affects motivation to roll off. I, I make some, or we make some guesses in, in the paper. Um, but at least as, as, as the elimination of straight ticket voting accelerates and it becomes a more contentious issue, um, this is an important question for us to explore. So thank you. So we just want to thank Matt and, and his co-authors um, for uh, a great paper. And I'm going to hand it over now um, to Mark Meredith of uh, UPenn, and he's going to be the discussant. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me to read these three excellent papers. I'm going to uh, not use screen share to commit myself to being very brief and just trying to give two or three comments per paper because I see there's uh, about 40 people here, so let's give, uh, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can and, and send some things via email uh, uh, afterwards. So I'll start with, uh, I'll go in the order and start with the uh, Akinci paper. Um, I had a little less time to digest this one, um, so I have just slightly fewer comments. Um, the, the two things I'll bring up, um, the, the first is I was a little, um, I was a little unclear how to balance um, a tension that appears to be uh, that, that the, uh, the dominant party uh, seems to face when, when thinking about issues like this. Um, 
it seems like the paper is largely focused on the idea that you want to maintain your supremacy in your um, in your ideological region, um, and and so that you're trying to thwart off um, like-minded challengers. Um, there does seem to be some tension there, though, as, as far as I read it, between your ability to do that and reduce your overall seat count, um, because if you're if you're requiring lots of different parties to form a coalition, um, sometimes you want uh, say a low threshold to be able to get your your parties in, and so I wanted to see a little more clarity about how parties should be managing um, how parties should be managing that 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 tension between the two strategic aims of maintaining your own um, your own superiority in your ideological in your ideological camp, but also ma making sure your your ideological camp captures as many seats as possible in, in future elections. Um, my second reaction to the paper is. Um, is thinking about uh, something that was up on the screen where we saw that so many um, of these reforms are ultimately uh, rejected and trying to think through, especially the ones that are restrictive, are, are, are rejected. Um, and one thing that you know, I, I tend, I think I observe in, in the world, although I'm, I might be wrong, is um, people tend to fight the battles of the last election when they get, when, when they, when they take, take office. And so, um, people maybe over over interpret what happens last time and then try to come up with electoral rules that um, that may have benefited them in, in, in the last election. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at here is I think the paper could do a little bit more to establish some form of construct validity about these effective party measures being something that is capturing future electoral success. And, and just so one suggestion I, I thought through, and it's certainly not the only way to do it, is where possible, maybe rerun the, the previous election using the, the new rules that people were putting forth and show how, how the legislature would look different under those rules to try to get at something about, you know, if people are being super myopic um, and, and just trying to, you know, relitigate the last election and thinking about how these, these rules might apply, um, give, give some evidence that it seems like they would benefit, they would benefit electorally from, from the rules that are getting put forward. And also, be interesting, interesting to compare that to the things that are successful or not, and are, are, are the rules that you know, would have brought with them the most electoral um, uh, gains, um, something that, um, something that, are those ones that are getting through or not. But overall, I really like the project, super cool data set, um, and I think there's lots of, uh, lots of, lots of good stuff in there. Um, okay, so turning to the Kurawaki paper, um, I really like what, what, um, what Shira's been doing with these cast, um, these cast vote records, these are great data. Um, I think this is an interesting, an interesting um, application of of where uh, of what clustering can do, and, and I really enjoyed reading the paper, and it was very thought provoking. Um, my macro reaction to the paper is that it seems like you're doing a lot of in sample description, and that's not always what I see as the goal of what you're trying to accomplish with clustering. And I think thinking back to the example that that you're appointed to with. The, the, Nader, um, the Nader case in Palm Beach County or the butterfly ballot in Palm Beach County, a lot of times what we're trying to use these data to do is make some out of sample or uh, extrapolation or, being, or be able to say something about how people would have behaved if the world was different. Um, and it's, it's not 100% clear to me um, how this method gets applied to do that, since it's simply sort of dividing existing data into groups, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a huge, you know, a huge change, and maybe maybe that's sort of the next thing that that, that Shira will be looking to do with these these types of approaches is to be able um, to um, uh, perhaps uh, do things like um, well, this is you know when we get really high dimensional cast vote records, here's a set of um, here's a set of choices that no one else in the data has, um, what group should we be putting this, uh, this individual into? Um, or um, thinking to the CCS example, you know, what I, one issue, and I'm sure has thought about a lot about this, I'm sure with, with thinking about um, straight and split ticket voting is it's always conditional on the candidates that you have before you. Um, and so when you, when you start dividing up the CCS data, it's a little dissatisfying right now that you have to do it by state because ultimately kind of what I want to know is, is the fact that um, Charlie Baker is doing so well in Massachusetts, is that a function of Massachusetts voters or is that a function of Charlie Baker? And what I really want to be able to do is, is see how, is see how um, 
uh, voters in in Rhode Island or something would behave, how, think through how they would be behaving if, if they had Charlie Baker on their their ticket. And so um, I think I think what Shiro is doing now is great, but I think the real power is going to be once um, he starts being able to do more things out of sample and or combining uh, cast vote records where people are voting on different offices but maybe have some bridges between them to try to bring bring these things into groups and so I look forward to seeing I look forward to seeing where, where Shiro takes us because I think that could that those have a lot of potential to them um, okay I'll, I'll conclude then by talking about um, the Thornburg et al paper um, I think it's a super interesting a super interesting paper uh, and I think it has a really powerful um, and simple insight which is um, when you observe roll off among people who uh, who cast a straight um, uh, party uh, option vote uh, only some of the time, but not all the time, that makes it much less likely that this roll off was done in error. And so I think um, that you know showing that that happens with some frequency is a really is a really useful um, contribution of, of this paper. Um, one criticism I have of of the paper and the presentation as they are now is it's not it's not entirely clear what the word effect is supposed to mean um, in, in, in this approach because a lot of the big questions about straight ticket um, option thinking like as, 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 as the Texas litigation reference is not about whether people use it or not it's about whether it's available or not and typically we need to have you know, to study things about that, we really need to be have variation in our independent variable. We need to be comparing places that do and don't have um, uh, straight ticket um, voting available. What this paper feels like it's trying to do is say, well, maybe if we control for enough stuff, we can account for uh, the differences uh, in, in, in some element of straight ticket voting, maybe, maybe to be able to learn something about the, the effect of the availability. I, I'm, I'm really skeptical there that, you, that you're going to be able to say something like that. So, you know, I think I like how, where the paper is going in trying to use um, additional information off these cat, cast vote records to learn, to decompose, you know, the differences in, in the things that are maybe innate to straight ticket voters uh, and, and their characteristics and their motivations and things like this. Um, and, and trying to say how often do we think this is just a function of the type of people who are using it. To me, these data are, are well suited to answer that question. Once you start veering off into these more policy questions that are related more to um, availability, I feel much less comfortable about the, develop, the, the ability of these data to, um, to talk about that. Um, my final comment is going to be, um, you know, you invoke Krosnick's theory of satisficing, which um, was built, but is sort of, uh, I, I don't think a great reflection of Simon's version of satisficing. Um, he draws from Simon, but doesn't really, um, I don't think he does it in a way that I feel is always that appropriate. And in many ways, I feel like Simon's version of satisficing is perhaps more appropriate for thinking about uh, some of the elements of straight party voting, which is in, in Simon's world, the, um, what's really important is the sequence of events that you sort of, you, you take things in sequence and when you reach something that's acceptable, um, you, you go with it. Um, and um, in, 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 in Krosnick's world, um, it's, it's more about how, um, uh, how, how motivated you are to do certain things. And just to play a little devil's advocate, I think if I'm applying Krosnick's theory of satisficing, um, straight ticket option voters should be more likely to answer the nonpartisan races as a function of having that option available to them because you've made the partisan choices easier. And so you've made it, you've made it so that they should have more, if you have a sort of stock of, of, of motivation, and when you get to the nonpartisan races, you should have more of that stock left than whether you had to think through all the partisan races. And so um, this is a, a, I, think, I think I would engage a little bit more with the specifics of the satisficing literature, think a little bit about what Simon's version of satisficing says when sort of coming up with predictions. And, um, and I think, again, this also relates to whether you're trying to identify people who are survey satisficing, you know, thinking more about the types of people and, and what you're doing is identifying types of people, or if what you're trying to do is learn about the, the, the availability of straight ticket voting, in which case maybe then Simon's version is, is, is more applicable. Uh, I'll send some more comments to the authors um, uh, via email, but uh, as a group, you know, excellent, excellent uh, set of papers as always for this conference and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to read and engage with them.
All right, thanks so much, Mark. I'm gonna hand it over to the presenters to take some time to respond to uh, Mark's comments. But before we do so, just a reminder to the audience members that you have a chance to ask questions um, based on the three presentations uh, to using the Q&A function. Just remember that when you are posing a question, uh, make sure that you are um, explicit in the uh, panelists that you're asking the question to. Uh, already we have two questions that are out there um, and, and, and we'd really like to, to, to get some more engagement from the audience. But let me hand it over. I'm going to go again in the order that is um, indicated uh, in uh, the program. So uh, Ezra, would you, would you mind um, starting off with your comments? Thank you, Nick. Um, I want to thank uh, Mark for all the good comments that he uh, offered for us. And um, yeah, and uh, the tension between the ability of the governing party and and the will of the governing party, I think, is is there. And I, since I'm talking about the attempts, there are all, all there are all these types types of uh, reforms that are not uh, being successful, uh, the, that are not followed through. I think. Um, I mean, the paper was already a bit long, so I couldn't uh, add in the um, add in the regression analysis that I run for the uh, success and failure of the uh, of the uh, electoral reform attempts. But uh, from what I uh, saw in the data, I can say that um, definitely uh, the restrictive reforms are harder to implement, and there are. They're harder, uh, especially when uh, the the reform itself is uh, changing the whole system. Like if there is a change from proportional system, if there's an attempt to change the proportional system to a mixed system, for instance, these are harder to implement. And But uh, I think um, uh, uh, when I see in the data as well is that if there is a threshold change, for instance, like from 5% to 7% or introduction of a threshold for pre-election coalitions, these types of our reforms are a more, um, more successful. And I think that touches upon the, uh, the tension of the governing party when they want to implement and restrict the, some of the smaller parties that are uh, that uh, that are competing in the same ideological cluster, uh, and uh, the uh, the power of the party within the parliament to implement those changes. And I think uh, because the thresholds uh, re reforms are much easier to implement, uh, they are much easier to implement just because of that. Uh, because uh, the party is able to convince the much smaller parties. Uh, whom they uh, they have the coalition or somehow uh, can uh, form a coalition to pass these type of reforms because that that kind of reforms can also benefit uh, the 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 already the parties that are in the same ideological cluster and they are already in the parliament so so they want to keep the other smaller parties that are never that are not uh, being able to participate in the parliament. Uh, out of the parliament uh, continuously. So I think those types of reforms have, uh, have been more uh, uh, successfully implemented because, due to this, this tension between the, the power of the governing uh, parties and the, uh, the possibility of sh uh, sharing, uh, uh, getting other people's, uh, other parties uh, vote for, for, for this legislation. And the example, I think uh, the, the, the other um, uh, the tension between the future elections versus the elections put them into office. And I think that's a very, very good comment. I will try to incorporate that. Uh, uh, and just the only problem I think is so for some of the electoral reforms, it's always easier to uh, calculate how the party is going to gain from the reform itself. And there are some already simulations run uh, uh, for different countries and uh, for the different electoral reforms, but that's not, uh, uh, that, that those types of uh, reforms or calculations are not uh, appropriate for each uh, electoral reform itself. So it might be a little bit tricky, but I'll definitely try to do that. Thank you.
Chiro, would you um, like to uh, respond to uh, Mark's comments? Sure. Um, I'll try to be uh, quick, but thank you so, so much. That was, uh, I think, very spot on. Um, so quickly on your on the first point that uh, we want to break out of sample, I think, yes, that's definitely one of the goals. And it is true that currently the, for example, the probability split estimates are um, conceptually, they are kind of latent quantities that uh, represent the fact that swing voters are likely to split, but they're also as likely to uh, stay on the party line because they're swing. Um, but currently the estimation is kind of like a sample average is how it kind of works under the hood. So, um, but the out of sample prediction is definitely something I could do. So I'll think about that. And in terms of um, the second part, yes. Yeah, so I think the, uh, one of the next steps is to try to incorporate candidate level covariates as a choice level variable. So for example, like code, whether the governor is a moderate or whether the governor is an incumbent and that will allow us to uh, not run separate models for Massachusetts and Rhode Island, but just throw everything in there with the choice level variables. And I think that uh, would be the first step to get at um, uh, that important question. So um, thank you so much. Uh, okay, um, Matt, uh, would you like to respond as well? Sure. Um, this is a, uh, a Th thank you, Mark, for the, the the comments. I really appreciate them. Um, they are they are one of they, they are spot on in terms of the uh, the issues in terms of causal inference. Um, you'll notice that there was a bunch of stuff in the about exit polls that I threw out of the presentation because it is basically trying to put a causal inference band aid on something that I honestly don't think warrants it. You can control for so many things, but um, I, I don't think I don't think that's I don't think that's sufficient. Really, what you would need to do, and this is something maybe to consider, um, is look at changes in policy. Um, and there are there are a number of states that have abolished straight ticket voting and kind of looking at changes there in terms of roll off. Um, but that's that's I think you know further down the line for the paper. Um, as far as as far as we go. Um, uh, I, I appreciate your 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 point about Simon's Simon's um, satisficing. Um, I'm I'm most familiar with, of course, the Krosnick version. I'm I'm most acquainted with the serve the, with the survey methodology literature. Um, but I'll I'll definitely I think that that that's a great suggestion. I'll definitely take a closer look at that. So, thank you. All right, so we there are actually uh, three questions that have been posed by uh, audience members that have not been answered as yet. Um, there's a question from uh, Theodore Lanzman um, for Ezra. Um, I can just quickly look over it, I mean, to repeat it. Many of your restrictive reform clusters are in post-Soviet states. How do you think this finding interacts with research on democratic backsliding in Hungary and Poland? Um, Ezra, you, you can respond to that. Let me just throw out another question from uh, David Holtzman, and I think this was directed to Shiro. Um, what is redact? Um, people's names aren't on the ballots with ranked choice voting. Um, uh, officials can, can even release ballot images. Um, at, would you like to respond to that um, comment and, 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 and question, Shiro? And then I think there's a last one from Robert Stein for Matthew, and we can just do a round of answers to this one. Um, and it's really looking at uh, if persons who vote straight ticket but do so not by using the ballot option, choosing all Dems or Republicans by race, um, you know, uh, is is do you are you able to pick that up within your your actual um, paper? Um, so I'll give you guys a chance. We probably might start off in reverse order, have um, uh, Matt answer the question from, from Robert Stein, and then Shiro, you can take the question from David Holtzman, and then Ezra um, from Theodore Landsman. All right? Uh, great, thank you. Um, there is actually a, 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 um, a 
there is actually good data on this in terms of South Carolina. We can look at individuals who voted straight ticket um, in terms of cho cho making the choices manually, but not actually pressing the lever. Um, I had so much stuff I kind of blew through a lot of the presentation, but the ballot design, uh, the ballot length questions for Charleston, um, when I was looking at Democrats and Republicans, I was comparing individuals who voted straight ticket, um, using the option and not using the option, but they voted all Democratic for all statewide offices or all Republican for all statewide offices. Um, I also, you know, uh, Duncan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I was only going to say that that at one point we did incorporate some of that, but I'm not sure we there was there was so much to do. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it certainly could be done given that we have the individual cast vote records. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks. So for David's question, I think this is in reference to um, an earlier question by Bob Stein, which uh, is in the answer category. Uh, but yeah, cer certainly um, for cast vote records, uh, they're, uh, they're largely anonymous and you could do lots of interesting stuff with only the votes. Um, so there are no demographic uh, data in the cast vote records at the individual level. So the covariates that you could put in are uh, geographic or ballot type level variables. But. All right, um, Ezra. Yeah, thank you very much, Theodore, for the question. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, many of the uh, restricted reform attempts are clustered uh, within the post-communist uh, countries, and but there are also surprising cases of Netherlands and Israel where there were. Uh, quite a few uh, attempts in the country, in these two countries, where the government uh, tried to implement it, uh, very uh, uh, different types of restrictive reforms, but they were uh, not very successful uh, in the Netherlands case, for instance, but in Israel, they were, they, the only uh, changes they could have uh, done was uh, increasing the thresholds uh, a little bit in each time. But definitely in Ro uh, Romania, for instance, there were a lot of attempts, and also in Poland, in Hungary as too. Uh, but in Hungary, uh, for instance, they were successful. Uh, Viktor Orban and his party were successful to implement a very different scheme of uh, electoral uh, reform. But it's, it's in the end, the, the main purpose was to uh, to uh, increase the uh, vote share of his own party, uh, well, his coalition party. Uh, so you definitely that has something to do with the, the bad democratic backsliding uh, that, uh, that we observe in, in uh, Hungary, for instance. In Poland too, like there were many attempts, um, and, but Poland has some variety in terms of the attempts, uh, even though uh, some of them are uh, restrictive, uh, since the uh, since the early elections that this country uh, started the early elections, they had also some attempts in the uh, in the permissive direction as well, but they weren't very uh, uh, they weren't very successful in uh, implementing uh, some of the uh, permissive attempts. And I agree with you. Uh, uh, the these uh, electoral reforms. When we talk about electoral reforms, we kind of like have. This, Think that the, this is going to be reforming the election system to the betterment of the democracy, but it's uh, in the reality, uh, unfortunately, it's not always the case. Sometimes, uh, in, in many of the cases we observe, it's all there's also governments uh, trying to manipulate their uh, uh, way to uh, power or uh, to prolongate their staying power in the uh, in government, and uh, I think that we observed in. Uh, in Hungary for sure, and in some of the cases there were attempts to do this in Poland as well. Thank you for the question. All right, Thank, thanks so much Ezra, and um, I just want to uh, thank, oh, I think we have one more question that just came through um, from uh, Rob Stein um, to Matthew and, and Duncan. Are you are straight ticket voters only those who use ballot options to vote straight ticket? Did you get that one already? No, this is just just coming up. So since since Rob has um, 
uh, pose that question. Uh, again, we're, we're over time, but I'll, I'll allow Matt and uh, Duncan to provide an answer for that question. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. the, the short answer is the cast vote records um, do uh, do indicate whether the voter actually selected the option. So um, in this case, it would be um, straight ticket voters. As far as I as I code in 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 in, in our we code in our data are individuals who uh, the cast vote record indicates they use that option. There are some individuals that might select that option, but change, um, you know, change t change a vote from Democratic to Republican or whatever. But we use it just as individuals who it, it shows that they selected the option. It shows what party they selected it for. So that's that's uh, that's it. Thanks. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thanks so much. Um, we can still, we still have some more time, and especially since our last panel and ended slightly abruptly, we still have about eight minutes left. Uh, so we can still, oh, there, are, see, I wasn't keeping abreast. So there are a few um, follow up questions. Uh, I think, you know, Rob, okay, Rob just made a comment. Um, so what we can do, we can um, open it up again for another round of questions, or we can have the, uh, the panelists pose any additional questions or comments to their fellow panelists. Uh, are, you, are, you, are, are the panelists, uh, or you can make a, a, a final comment with regard to your papers as well. Um, Nick, I'm gonna take a point sure. of privilege. And I, I, this is really a question for Matt and for Shiro, and I'm, I'm trying, maybe Sh uh, Shiro can't quite answer this question. Um, I was involved in this litigation in Rhode Island defending the straight ticket option, and the way in which I did that was I um, showed how the roll-off uh, for that last partisan race was um, less when you used a straight ticket option. Uh, um, uh, and so I, basically made the argument to the court that the legislature was simply um, trying to preference a certain type of roll-off or mitigate against a certain type of roll-off. And so I wonder for Matt and, and Shira, if they could somehow get at that question, do we see that, la that last partisan race that might be on a, a ballot? Do we see more roll-off happening with that um, race uh, uh, in your data, Shiro? And um, Matt, could you talk something about what you see in your data? Um, I, will, I will defer to Shiro on that one. I know he's done, done a, lot of, a lot of analysis with that. Um, uh, as far as partisan roll off, that's something that we're, our project is still working to deal with. Um, don't re I'm sorry. Oh, I'll have my head, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. So, and certainly in this, in the Palm Beach, in the in the um, paper of Florida example, there the last partisan office, there's much more roll off. Um, but in the South Carolina data, I think uh, roll off is pretty. I, I want to say I, I don't I don't recall a systematic pattern of kind of roll off increasing um, on the ballot. I, I can say that the literature um, does say that that the partisan roll off, especially down ballot, is is much lower. I I I've, I've reviewed that, of course, very thoroughly. But as far as cast vote records, um, that is, I think, a fertile area to be explored. But I think the Mike, Michael's uh, initial question about initial finding in Rhode Island seems interesting. So I guess it's the finding that compared to voters who don't use the option, but nevertheless uh, vote straight, uh, straight party vo voting option, voters roll off less. Did I get that right? Okay. Well, I will also just second Nicholas's um, uh, last thing. So if there are any other questions from the audience or if any of the uh, presenters wants to have a final comment, uh, we'll open that up now. No one's jumping in. All right. <laughs>
So um, let's wrap this up. I put into the um, uh, side chat a link for the registration for the next panel tomorrow afternoon. It starts at 1. I know the Zoom webinar will say 1230. Um, uh, you know, I. I could have done this better, obviously. Um, but uh, so if you're in the audience, show up at one o'clock. If you're a presenter, show up a little bit early just so we can test everything out. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see all of you back then uh, tomorrow at uh, one o'clock to have, we're gonna have like two really cool panels on uh, what's happening with COVID-19 and um, uh, election administration challenges and uh, public opinion about it. Uh, so hope that uh, you folks can uh, join us uh, tomorrow for some uh, continu continuation of some really great pa uh, papers. So thanks to all our presenters today. Thanks to Nick and Mark. Um, and, you know, thanks to the people in the earlier panels as well. Um, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye.